Hello and welcome. I'm Miles O'Brien, live from the Kennedy Space Center, the Space Shuttle Discovery. Now about 48 minutes to an intended launch. Storm clouds on the horizon, but no technical constraints right now to launch. This the second launch since the launch loss of Columbia. Joining me for the next hour of special coverage of the hopeful launch of Space Shuttle Discovery, former Shuttle Commander Eileen Collins sitting at my side here and the editor-in-chief of nasawatch.com, Keith Cowing, joining us from Washington. We'll bring you up to date on this tense liftoff and this tense countdown in just a moment. But first, let's check some other headlines with Frederica Whitfield in Atlanta. Fred? Thanks, Miles. O'Brien. Thank you very much, Frederica. And uh, no one here at the Kennedy Space Center can recall a much more tense countdown than this one. There has been a raging internal debate over the safety of the space shuttle, which is, after all, in its final years, a date certain for its retirement at the end of 2010, some 16 missions planned, and now we know every one of them is make or break. Let's set the clock back about three and a half years ago to the Space Shuttle Columbia, which about 80 seconds after launch in that January of 2003, a piece of foam about a pound and a half fell off the orange external fuel tank, striking the left leading edge of that orbiter. 16 days later, as the crew came home to Earth, the searing hot heat of re-entry, there was a breach in that leading edge, edge of the wing, and the uh, orbiter disintegrated and we lost the crew of seven. NASA spent about a billion dollars on redesigning many aspects of that external fuel tank and the space shuttle to know, learn more about it, to photograph it better, to inspect it on orbit, to remove some of the foam which was most susceptible to come off. And yet a year ago, uh, when the space shuttle Discovery flew on its return to flight mission, what uh, surprised most everybody involved in the space program at that time was to see a large piece of foam falling off yet another portion of that external fuel tank. This from a place called the so-called the so PAL ramp, a 32-pound piece of foam, about a pound of which broke away, uh, which had been considered susceptible, but uh, NASA decided not to remove it before the launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery. Since that time, that PAL ramp has been removed, and the external fuel tank, or at least a scale model of it, has been tested in a wind tunnel to see if this, the largest, most significant aerodynamic change to that external fuel tank since the beginning of the program, is safe to fly. NASA engineers have determined that, but what it exposed was about three dozen other pieces of foam, which are in fact susceptible to falling off, so-called ice frost ramps. These are pieces of foam designed to cover the brackets which uh, connect those pipes and plumbing along that area where that so-called PAL ramp was. 36 of them, many engineers concerned that they could fall off and cause some damage. There on the left, you see the, what the PAL ramp looked like in yellow, and as we zoom in there, you'll get a sense of the nature of these so-called ice frost ramps. They aren't very big, and over the history of the program, no one has seen a piece large enough to cause any damage come off, and yet engineers are very concerned. The top engineer for the program saying he's no-go for launch. The top safety engineer, a safety officer for the program, no go for launch, but nevertheless not appealing their decision, putting it on the desk of the administrator, Mike Griffin, who says he's going to override those concerns, signed on the dotted line, and thus witnessing the countdown you're seeing right now. Let's listen to Mike Griffin just a few days ago. I'm willing, as administrator, looking at the whole picture, I'm willing to take a little bit of programmatic risk now, and you'll notice I did not say crew risk. I'm willing to take some programmatic risk now in order to prevent an excessive buildup of programmatic risk later on. This is, in fact, what you pay me to do. Notice the difference there. Programmatic risk, loss of vehicle, not loss of crew. No one here says that a big piece of foam striking discovery, if that would occur, is an imminent risk to the crew. They will make it to space just fine, and they have many options. First of all, they will inspect that orbiter to see if they have a problem. And if they do, they have the option of staying upwards of 80 days at the International Space Station, waiting for a rescue mission from another space shuttle orbiter, Atlantis. Let me tell you about the crew's day. Crew of seven, they're strapped in right now. The hatch is closed. The fuel tank is filled with 500,000 gallons of uh, liquid hydrogen and oxygen. We're in the final hold in this countdown, now about 43 minutes to the intended launch, a specific launch time in order to rendezvous with that International Space Station. They were up early, a little uh, after 5 in the morning, 6 in the morning, made their way toward breakfast and the customary photo opportunities. 
uh, and had an opportunity to go through their whole ritual of launch here. The photo opportunity followed by the crew suit up where they donned those bright orange pumpkin suits, those pressure suits which they wear into orbit and on re-entry. Later they walked out in that once again familiar ritual applauded by uh, workers here at the Kennedy Space Center who have uh, longed for this opportunity to launch another shuttle having waited uh, a year after the return to flight, three and a half years since Columbia and the disaster that that represented. The Vice President, Dick Cheney, is here viewing in the VIP area among the dignitaries here uh, to watch this uh, hopeful launch of the space shuttle. But as we say, we are watching very closely the storm clouds, convective activity as they say, so-called anvil clouds which are sheared off thunder clouds all within a 20 and 30 mile disc from where we sit right now because they have to not only be concerned about the launch but the possibility that in the event of an abort the space shuttle discovery would have to come here on a landing. Bonnie Schneider has been watching the NASA weather picture at the Cape for us all this afternoon, and she has the latest for us. Bonnie? Well, Miles, we're talking about those anvil clouds, the top shelf of the thunderstorm, and they're very high up into the atmosphere, but what happens is these can kind of stretch out over a thunderstorm, and they actually point into the direction of where the thunderstorm is headed. So when we look at this picture, this is visible satellite imagery. You can see the clouds kind of stretching all the way from Orlando to the Kennedy Space Center. But when you look at radar, you'll actually see that the winds are coming in out of the east. It's a little confusing, but that's because we're getting the surface wind out of the east that's bringing on some of that cool air from the ocean. And what it is doing is creating those sea breeze thunderstorms that are well out towards Orlando, but some of those high cloud tops are working their way close enough that if they're within 20 nautical miles of the landing strip, uh, perhaps, or within 10 nautical miles of the shuttle launch pad, that they could scrub the mission due to weather. So that's what we're watching at this time, how close they come. And you can see the distance between the two. The shuttle launch pad needs to be within 10 nautical miles of clear weather and no thunderstorms certainly in sight or none of those anvil clouds that we were speaking of earlier. Now if we take a look at the radar picture now what we're looking at is again winds out of the northeast but here are those thunderstorms well towards Orlando that's where we're getting some of the heavier downpours but again the winds from the upper levels are kind of stretching out the cloud tops and bringing some of that moisture and some of that energy towards the Kennedy Space Center and it's very evident here on our visible satellite perspective but what's interesting to note is if the wind direction changes and it turns a little bit more coming in from the northwest we could get some of this pushing to the south and we can get clear skies for the Kennedy Space Center and for the shuttle launch. Something we'll be watching minute by minute here as well. Back to you. All right, it seems very touch and go in the weather. Bonnie Schneider, thank you very much. We're going to take a break. When we return, we're going to meet the crew. Among the crew members, the second African-American to fly to space, the pilot for John Glenn, and the only astronaut who has a twin brother in the astronaut office. Stay with us. The kid in me, the 12 year old that dreamed of doing this job, you know, is still in there. But I'm also, you know, uh, realistic about it, and I know we have an important job ahead of us. And I, I'm more, you know, determined to be successful in completing our part and, you know, making sure we get everything done that we're going off to do. The clap. I do see us as being part of the wave, the second wave of African-American women to fly. Now, it is the second wave. It's not the fifth wave. It's not the tenth wave. So uh, it's a low number, which in my mind says that we still have some work to do to encourage young African-American women to uh, pursue careers in science, math, or engineering. Stephanie Wilson, walking where Mae Jameson did uh, several years ago, the second African-American woman to fly into space, Harvard educated and an engineer. Just one of seven members who are now strapped aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery. Uh, strapped in and going through checklists, doing what astronauts do right now, which is to make sure they don't be responsible for a mistake. Joining us right now is the commander of the previous Discovery mission, retired commander, first female to command a space shuttle, is Eileen Collins. Eileen, um, Let's talk just before we get into who's who on this flight. Stephanie Wilson, this is, this is a big accomplishment for a woman and an African-American woman, and you, having been first in so many things, must really connect with that. Well, you know, I think it's a big deal, and I agree very much with what Stephanie said about being the second. Uh, we need more. For example, yeah. we have... I was the first woman commander. Pam Melroy has just been assigned as the second woman shuttle commander. The problem is there's nobody after her. We have not hired any other women pilots. So uh, Stephanie and I do things 
like go out and talk to young women, young men too, about field of engineering, the space program. You can be an astronaut someday if you want. It's a very exciting career field with much left to be discovered and invented. We're it, trying to inspire these young people to look at the space is program. Is it just that not that many women select this as a career? Well, I think there's a turning point. You know, young women do well in math and science in elementary and, and junior high, but once they get into high school, they start turning in other directions or losing interest altogether. And we really would like them to look at They can be engineers, and young women are smart enough to do this. If you like engineering, if you like math, please take a look at engineering as a career field. Uh -huh. You could lead you into space someday. It's a big issue, and it's more than this hour can afford to handle it because it is such a big one. Let's go through the crew now. Steve Lindsay is the commander. Uh, Steve, you may recall, if you really follow the space program closely, uh, got a lot of attention as the pilot on the mission when John Glenn returned to space back in October of 1988. He's a fellow um, uh, U.S. Air Force colonel and uh, graduate of the Air Force Academy. Uh, this is his fourth flight and second command. Uh, has been to the space station before. How would you describe Steve to somebody who doesn't know him? Well, Steve and I worked very closely together. Uh, we went through test pilot school together. He was the top graduate in his class. Very quiet yet intelligent person. Very thought-provoking person. Um, he helped with the accident investigation after Columbia. Um, helped us devise a plan, uh, the logic that we would go through in clearing the orbiter to come back and fly again. Uh, very dedicated to space flight. Uh, Steve and I work closely together because our missions are so very similar. Yeah. Um, great guy, really enjoyed working with him. And, and helped out the husband family, the family That's of right. Rick Husband, the commander of Columbia in ways that I don't have time to go into, a but remarkable, com compassionate person, truth truthfully. Mark Kelly, who is the pilot, he has a brother, Scott, who happens to be his twin and who happens to also be a, an astronaut. How's that for a series of events? <laughs> Competitive brothers going all the way to the top of their field. Uh, he is a commander of the United States Navy, uh, a veteran of one space fight. He is the uh, first Kelly twin to fly a second flight, uh, age 41, uh, born in Orange, New Jersey, from uh, West Orange, actually, and likes uh, cycling, weightlifting, and golf. And um, we recognize him because he has the mustache. Mark has the mustache, Scott does not. And that's helpful to all the folks in the astronaut corps. What's it like having twins in the astronaut corps? What are the odds of that? Well, it was difficult at first when uh, we brought them into the office in 1996. No one could tell them apart, so we would always look at their badges until finally they decided to do the mustache thing and we could tell them apart. And Scott worked for me for a while as the um, in, in Rendezvous. Uh, Mark has worked quite a bit in the uh, robotics uh, area. Um, this is Mark's second flight and we hope that he moves on to be a commander on his next one. And uh, Piers Sellers is uh, the um, uh, born in Great Britain. He's, he has a doctorate. He is a, a well-educated guy been on one uh, space flight before and will be the lead spacewalker on uh, really some very interesting spacewalks including one that will put him at the end of a much extended robotic arm for the shuttle to see if it can be used to repair a space shuttle in flight. Uh, maybe a third spacewalk to try to test out some repair techniques uh, in orbit. What's Pierce like as a guy, as a person? Oh, it, Pierce is a very uh, low-key, easygoing, got a great sense of humor, um, but also very intense when it comes to getting the job done, and, he, and he's a great engineer. You'll notice uh, Pierce during the spacewalk is he'll be wearing the red stripes on his legs. Um, he's our uh, lead spacewalker, as you said. Um, he worked very closely with my crew as we did some of these development techniques and uh, inspection techniques uh, that they'll be doing on the spacewalk. All right, Mike Fossum will be his spacewalking cohort. Uh, he is a lieutenant colonel in the United States Air Force Reserves and a Texas A&M proud Aggie. What's he like? Well, Mike, again, a, a very intelligent, a very easygoing guy. I have to say that one of the criteria of being selected as an astronaut is your ability to get along with other people mm -hmm. and the ability, ability to communicate well. And uh, Mike is a very uh, easy to communicate with, easygoing guy. Um, this is his first flight. I know he's really excited to finally get up in space. He was in the class of 98, and he'll be one of the first astronauts from that class to fly. Lisa Nowak, who is a Navy commander, mission specialist. This is, she is a rookie. She's uh, 42, born in Washington. She likes crossword puzzles. I don't think she's doing anything right now. Although this might be a good time to do a crossword, except she is the flight engineer, and she has her hands full right now. Well, you know, Lisa flew in the Navy, and I. Uh, one of the things I think people don't know about her is she's a mother. She's got three children. Um, her youngest are twins, uh, twin girls, and we have talked very much about flying in space when you have children and some of the hardships that go along with saying goodbye to your kids and I know that the men go through the same thing it's not just the moms but the dads yeah, go through the same it's thing. It's particularly hard for a mom and you've done that. Stephanie Wilson we talked a lot about already her first space flight second African-American then uh, Tomas Ryder 
who is uh, with the European Space Agency. You don't see him as much. Uh, he is a veteran of one long space flight on the Russian space station Mir. There you see the basics on uh, Stephanie Wilson. Uh, as we say, a little piece of history here. As you say, it shouldn't take so long for this to happen. And then finally, Tom, uh, Tomas Reuter, who will spend uh, six months on the International Space Station, bringing it up to a crew of three for the first time since the loss of Columbia. Well, let, when we come back, we're going to get into this whole issue of the safety of the space shuttle. 25 years plus now it has been flying, and there are many calls in many quarters uh, and many questions about how safe it is to fly out this mission. 16 more flights planned. We'll get into that after a break. Stay with us. There's a company that... Welcome back to our coverage of the intended launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery. We're now uh, about 27 minutes away from an intended launch, but currently the weather is not permitting a launch. We're watching that weather very closely. As a matter of fact, we've been watching an uh, aircraft they call the Shuttle Training Aircraft, which is a Gulfstream business jet outfitted to fly just like a shuttle. Uh, which has been flying around, shooting uh, approaches as the uh, shuttle might if it had to come back here quickly to get a sense of what the weather is like. Let's check in with Bonnie Schneider in the Weather Center and see what she is seeing. Bonnie? That's right. They're also checking to see where the thunderstorms are and where those anvil cloud tops are, which is so important because even though on our radar picture now you might see the thunderstorms well towards Orlando, those cloud tops kind of stretch and extend, and they can actually do that for hundreds of miles. In this case, we're looking at only at a 30-mile distance, and right now they are saying, according to the 45th Weather Squadron, that right now it's no-go due to weather. But that has been changing over the past couple hours. We've seen it going back and forth to go to no-go, so it's very possible it may change again. Once we get nine minutes right before the shuttle launch, the weather makes the call. Of course, that could change minute by minute as we get closer to the actual time of the launch. But at nine minutes, too, that's when the weather department there will make a call as far as what the weather is. At present, we are seeing those cloud tops stretching over close enough to where the shuttle launch site is. Here's the thunderstorms right now south of Orlando, but on the visible imagery, you can see the cloud tops kind of stretching all the way across towards the Space Center. That is because the winds in the upper levels of the atmosphere are coming in out of the west, so they're blowing the tops of the thunderstorms in this direction towards the Space Center. Not a good thing, and that's why we're seeing weather, unfortunately, right now, causing some problems with getting the launch to get going on time. Now, what we're looking at at the winds right now at the surface, they're coming in out of the east. This is more of a sea breeze effect that's creating the thunderstorms, but we can't have any thunderstorms or any anvil cloud tops, meaning electrically cl charged cloud tops, anywhere within this vicinity. For the landing strip, it can't be within 20 nautical miles, and for the shuttle launch pad itself, it can't be within 10 nautical miles. Right now, we do have those anvil or electrically charged cloud tops within this vicinity, so that's why it's red right now. But, Miles, as you know, this could change minute by minute. Yes, it can, Bonnie Schneider. Thank you very much. And uh, there have been cases where they have actually taken it inside down to the five-minute level on that countdown, even with bad weather, uh, and held to that point um, on the prospect that they might get a little patch of blue. So there is a little bit of flexibility. I think you could go either way here. We're going to watch it very closely, obviously. We're also watching very closely uh, the orbiter itself and the shuttle and the changes that have been made in the three and a half years since uh, we lost Columbia and her crew of seven. I want to walk you through very briefly uh, some of the key changes that have been made to the space shuttle, taking a look at some animation we put together here. Uh, if you recall, um, as we go down to uh, the launch pad uh, uh, and give you a sense and kind of fly you right inside the shuttle if you could, uh, take a look. This is the inside of the leading edge of the wing. There are sensors now in there designed to detect if any sort of impact occurs. You recall that was the problem which led to the loss of Columbia. Over here, foam removed from these bipod ramps, the source of the foam in the case of Columbia. In this case, the POW ramps have been removed. 32 pounds of foam no longer there. It flew off in the case of uh, Eileen Collins' mission one year ago. Cameras all located all throughout the shuttle external tank, the shuttle itself and the solid rocket boosters. An extended boom at the length of this robotic arm to allow them to do better searches on the backside of the shuttle for any sort of damage. Exploding bolts have a catcher in them so they don't cause a debris risk, uh, something that was a concern of the Columbia Accident Investigation Board. The crew itself, 
uh, has additional training uh, to do repairs if necessary, and if need be, can use the airlock to go into the International Space Station and spend upwards of 80 days there in a so-called safe haven. So those are some of the key uh, issues that have been addressed. What remains outstanding, though, are uh, some foam pieces of foam on the external fuel tank that remain, and some engineers are concerned pose a threat to the shuttle. Uh, take you back to Columbia, first of all, and take a look at that piece of foam as it came off. It was about a pound and a half in weight, about the size of a briefcase, 80 seconds or so after launch, blasted right into that left wing. We found out later it caused a huge hole. At the time, the engineers had no idea that the foam could be such a risk and allowed that uh, orbiter to come back home not knowing what kind of jeopardy that crew was in. They spent an awful lot of time, two and a half years and a billion dollars, trying to fix this problem. And then last year when Eileen Collins commanded Discovery on their way on that return to flight mission to the International Space Station not long after launch, what we saw was very uh, surprising indeed to most everybody in and out of the program. There you see it. Piece of foam coming off of that so-called PAL ramp, which has now been removed. It fell harmlessly, fortunately, but uh, nevertheless, real, many engineers realized at that point they had to go back to the drawing board. They've done a lot more testing since then, back to the drawing board type stuff and have used high-speed photography. They have taught, um, thrown ice at tiles and at re reinforced carbon-carbon, the hard, brittle material that is at the leading edge of the wing. They have done everything they can to get a sense of really what kind of damage is caused. There you see the hole that was made at the Southwest Research Center in San Antonio when they tested to see what happened when the foam of the size of Columbia struck the leading edge of the wing. That was a real, that was a moment where many NASA engineers were just taken aback at the damage this very light material could cause. In the meantime, what's left behind on the uh, space shuttle are these so-called ice frost ramps. Uh, the, re the reduction, the removal of the uh, PAL ramp has left these ice frost ramps, which are about three dozen on the tank. And uh, those uh, particular pieces uh, are of concern as you look at them dealing with the tank and testing pieces of it that some of those ice frost ramps could break free. The question is, how big would those pieces be? Could they cause some damage? And that's what led to the senior engineer for the program and the chief safety officer saying, as long as those ice frost ramps are on there, we're no go for launch. The administrator of NASA begged to differ. Listen. Every single space flight that this country or any country has ever done has to weigh uh, performance risk against safety risk against cost risk and that's what we're doing here. Uh, schedule matters. It, it, can't, it can't dominate, uh, it can't rule the roost, but schedule matters. So Mike Griffin overruled that, en that top engineer, that top safety officer and said they would accept the risk to the space shuttle, to the vehicle understanding that it is not a risk to the crew. The crew has the option of safe haven at the space station and a rescue mission. Still, a very tense launch countdown here at the Kennedy Space Center today. When we return, we're going to tell you a little bit more about the countdown itself and what is going on right now. And we'll take you to that dramatic moment when people weigh in. They, you know, put their credibility on the line and say go or no go for launch. It's the final poll before the final countdown that they call terminal count. Stay with us. Joined here by some special guests, uh, right beside me is Eileen Collins, the former shuttle commander, the first woman ever to do that. She flew here uh, last year in Discovery on the return to flight mission, which itself was a nail biter. This one is just as much of a nail biter, kind of return to flight uh, part two. Keith Cowing, uh, who is the editor-in-chief of NASAwatch.com, watching all of this unfold uh, from Washington. First of all, Eileen, let's just talk, uh, get people up to date here on the thinking about the weather right now. Uh, as we look around here, I see a lot of patches of blue, but unfortunately, uh, really kind of off to the north and west of here, it appears there's some thunderstorm activity and low ceilings. Right now it's no-go. What will they do? Will they stop now or will they try to 
see if there's a possibility this will improve. Well, to launch, you have to have both an observed go condition and a forecast go condition. And the forecast is in there because you might have an emergency return. So the ceiling needs to be greater than 5,000 feet. I don't know what it is now, but it appears to be lower than that. Uh, there might be a little bit of a visibility issue out at the shuttle landing facility for an emergency landing. The launch track looks uh, fairly good, but we need to be go for both launch and emergency return. All right, and we'd like to welcome our viewers all around the world to CNN, and let's listen for just a moment as they conduct their final poll. LRD. LRD is go. SRO. SRO is no go for weather. And CDR. CDR is go. Copy that. And launch director and TD, launch team is ready to proceed with the exception of uh, Houston flight and SRO both for weather at this time. Okay, copy all that. Let me do my poll at this time. Chief Engineer, Launch Director, verify no constraints to launch. Engineer and team is go. Copy. KC Safety Mission Assurance. We're go. Thank you. Payload Launch Manager. Mike Good, NASA and Boeing Space Station team is go. Copy that. Thank you. Range weather. Range Weather Launch Director 212. That's Mike Leinbach, who is the launch director. Yeah, Range Weather Launch Director, go no go for launch. Range Weather is uh, currently red on the uh, Anvil group. Copy. Ops Manager, Launch Director. Launch Director, Ops Manager, the MMT is not working any issues. We are following the weather calls, and we prefer to hold at 9 here. Yeah, the strategy is going to be, uh, we'll continue to hold at 9, we'll use the window, and if uh, luck is on our side today, we'll go. If not, uh, we'll try it again tomorrow. Office Manager, conclusion. NTD, Launch Director 212. Go ahead. Okay, um, the strategy here will be to uh, use up the whole, win the whole window while we're holding here at 9 minutes, and if we get a go from flight and range weather and SRO, we will press on. Okay. GSRO 212. Go SRO. We are no go for an additional uh, boat in the box. We have a foul range. Hi, you've been listening to NASA's launch director, Mike Leinbach, right the far right of that screen there, as he's been going through his um, uh, various um, polling stations, all those technical expertises. And in both cases, people who are associated with weather saying no go. Now, what they're going to do is, in about uh, two minutes or so, they are supposed to come out of that hold. Uh, the clock should begin ticking, or should have, if everybody was go, and begin what's called terminal count, the final nine minutes. They'll keep it held at that nine minute mark until it's too late to begin that countdown in order to meet that very narrow window. Once again, to explain to you, in order to catch up with the International Space Station, they have to launch almost precisely as it passes overhead, uh, like that uh, quarterback tossing a football to the receiver. So. At the back end of this window, Eileen Collins, uh, we've been saying all along that they've, you know, they've got this specific time that they have to fly. There is some time, it, it would cost them a little more fuel to get there, but they could still get to the space station for another five minutes after that, right? That's right. The launch window is about 10 minutes long. We usually try to launch right in the middle of that window, so we have five minutes slack. Another option is the launch team could decide um, at this time to count down to T-minus five minutes just before the APUs start. You don't want to start the APUs unless you got a, that's the auxiliary power units, unless you have a pretty good shot at launching. So we'll see what they do. Because you're, you're using a consumable, yes. consumable and you want it's to make sure using. that's the case. So in essence, uh, once we get here in a minute from now is when that uh, launch countdown uh, uh, the nine minute hold should have ended and it should the t clock should have ticked so another five minutes after that uh, we should get the word that it would be too late to launch unless there's some miraculous break uh, in the weather so we'll sit here and wait and the crew waits and you've been through this you've been strapped in waiting for this um, at this point are you what are you thinking 
Well, it's, it will be a letdown for the crew if we scrub today. I think it'll be a letdown for everybody, but there's, we cannot control the weather. So at that point in time, the crew will, if we, if we decide not to launch today, the crew will go into um, a, a recycle. They'll back out in some of their switch throws, and they'll get ready to get out of the orbiter as soon as the closeout crew can get back out there. Right. And one of the things that will, I'm sure will be one of the discussions as to when to try again. They'll take a, a spend a lot of time looking at the weather, of course. But one of the issues that they're going to have to consider is whether to fix that bulky thruster we've been talking about all day. In other words, if it's a bad day anyway, looking, looking like one tomorrow, and they can get to that thruster and try to fix that thermostat or heater, they might want to do that. And that could mean a delay of more than a day, potentially. I'm just speculating a little bit, but I know it's not an easy fix. That, that's true. I, and I'm not really sure how much of that they can fix on the launch pad, but they'll definitely take a look at that and take a look at, you know, what are your options downstream? If we do try to launch tomorrow and we don't go, then we'll have to stand down Monday so we can resupply the cryogenics that are for the electrical system on the shuttle. And we wouldn't try again until Tuesday. All right. That's a lot to consider right now. This is exactly what they pay people who run the shuttle program for. We're going to come back. We'll be watching the weather, watching the skies very closely here. Otherwise, no technical constraints getting in the way of the launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery. Mother Nature having a say. Back with more in a moment. This just in to CNN. While you were in the commercial break, the launch was scrubbed. It will not fly today. The Space Shuttle Discovery will remain on the pad. The crew will begin the process of undoing what they did to get to where they are and return to the operations and checkout room, the crew quarters. The clock will be recycled. A new countdown will begin. The only question right now is when will they try again? Eileen Collins, you heard um, the NASA launch director, Mike Leinbach, uh, in concurrence with uh, some of his counterparts in Houston. Um, Essentially, what they were saying was uh, the weather was good enough for launch, but not good enough for a, an emergency landing is what yeah, it boils down we've, to. We've got to be able to cover for the emergency return case. It looks like there's still thunderstorm ambles within 20 miles, and that would potentially trigger lightning or could cause a problem to the shuttle if we had to do an emergency return. So not, as they put it, uh, is a, a dynamic situation, not going to take any chances. Uh, Clearly, they're not, uh, weather is not the kind of thing you fool around with with these things. Well, that's true, and it's disappointing, but like I said before, we just can't change the weather. And now what's going to happen is the mission management team will meet. They'll take a look at all the, you know, not only the weather for tomorrow, but they'll take a look at this um, heater problem on the RCS jet. They'll take a look at the cryogenics reload that they may have to do, and they'll make a decision on whether or not we'll try tomorrow or maybe go to Monday. A lot of factors to consider. If they do, in fact, decide to go for tomorrow. The launch time to meet up with the space station will be 3.26 p.m. As we say, it slides back about uh, 20 minutes every day. Let's go to Bonnie Schneider, who's been watching this with us from the Weather Center. Bonnie, that's, uh, those are some pretty strict rules they have here about weather. Uh, it actually looks, I bet if we waited uh, probably 10 or 15 minutes longer, I bet they'd be okay because it looks like it's kind of clearing out. What are you seeing? Well, right now what we're seeing on the radar picture are still some thunderstorms in the Orlando vicinity, but the reason the mission was scrubbed was because there were anvil cloud tops. Those are electrically charged and very, very dangerous because even though they can be miles away from the thunderstorm itself, they are connected to the thunderstorm. So the shuttle doesn't want to be near any of those clouds because of the electric, electrically charged nature of them. So what they were reporting were some of those anvil clouds within 20 nautical miles of the landing strip, not within 10 nautical miles of the shuttle launch pad. That's the parameters for uh, for launch, but for the landing strip also needs to be clear as well. And when we look at the big picture now on the radar, you'll find that most of the thunderstorms have managed to stay to well to the west of where you are. And that's why you're seeing kind of breaks in the clouds on the picture there on the screen. But here's a little bit of rain now south of Orlando, some rain coming into the vicinity, but the thunderstorm intensity has died down a bit over the past hours. So, Miles, you may be right that if time were to go on a little bit further, this situation would change. But there is something to note. It's not only the thunderstorms itself, but it's also the wind direction. What happened was we had winds on the upper levels of the atmosphere first coming in from the northwest. That would have been good because that was kind of steering this a little bit further to the south of the Kennedy Space Center. But what happened was within the past 30 minutes or so, some of those upper level winds shifted and they started coming in directly from the west. So what that did was break off those tops of the thunderstorms, the anvil clouds, and kind of steer them straight in this line, close enough to 
that landing strip and close enough to scrub the mission. Unfortunately, within 20 nautical miles of where the landing strip is located, and you can see that here on the screen. Here's the landing strip, and here's the shuttle launch pad. So unfortunately, right now, those anvil cloud tops are really menacing and fortunately making for a scrub mission for today. But hopefully tomorrow we can have a lot better weather and a better situation for launch. Miles? Bonnie, all right, Bonnie Schneider, let's hope for the best. If they give it a try tomorrow, we will certainly be here. We'll be here any day they try it. Uh, let's take a listen, because it, it happened while we were in a commercial break. Let's listen to the exchange between the NASA launch director, uh, Jeff, uh, excuse me, uh, Mike Leinbach, and some of his counterparts in Houston as they made the decision. NTD, launch director, was that uh, a scrub this attempt? Okay, sir, I copy that. And attention all personnel, we are going to go ahead and scrub for today. And uh, let's see, uh, OTC, TBC, PTC, any folks have any other work we need to do prior to us uh, breaking out here? OTC negative. And TBC off, thanks, I'll check. PTC negative. Okay, and that's for all testing. This is shuttle launch control, T minus nine minutes and holding. And as we heard from our launch director, Mike Leinbach, uh, we have scrubbed our launch attempt for today. Uh, the primary concern was for anvil clouds within 20 miles of the shuttle landing facility. Uh, we will plan for a 24-hour turnaround, which would open our launch window tomorrow, our preferred launch time tomorrow at 3.26 p.m. Again, the preferred launch time for Sunday, July the 2nd, 3.26 p.m. Eastern time from Kennedy State. The words of uh, Bruce Buckingham, who is a public affairs officer inside that uh, firing room there, just a little ways from where we sit, as they made the announcement, the narrow window, that narrow opportunity to meet up with the space station today happened to be a bad weather moment here on the Florida Peninsula. So they won't fly today. We'll be hearing very shortly when they want to try again. Not only do they have weather considerations to, to uh, factor in, but as we told you, they have one thruster on this uh, space shuttle that is not operative, that may decide that it is a good opportunity to fix that before they try again. So we'll keep you posted. Uh, we're going to be back with more, and uh, we'll delve into a little bit on the whole future of the space shuttle program in just a moment. Stay with us. When I do it, I feel the blood rushing through me, and I keep going back for more. Today, maybe not tomorrow either. We'll find out very shortly on that. What the crew is doing right now is, well, quite frankly, it's a bit of a letdown. They're uh, getting through, going through the process of um, throwing all the switches back and getting uh, unstrapped, the hatch will come open and out they will come uh, before too long, uh, making their way to the crew quarters for at least another night. NASA managers have a lot to consider besides the weather. They have a technical issue which they decided to fly with, but they probably would prefer to fly with it fixed, and that is one uh, rocket thruster that has a bad thermostat, bad heater, and would not be uh, usable potentially for the commander for very uh, precise movement as they dock at the International Space Station and other precise uh, maneuvers. So there'll be a meeting that's probably underway even as we speak or will be shortly and we'll hear very soon as to when uh, Discovery's uh, next launch attempt will be. In the meantime, uh, that's the near-term future uh, that we're talking about. Let's, let's talk a little more long-term and bring in Keith Cowing who's been patiently waiting for us to include him in this discussion. It's been a busy uh, 40 minutes or so, Keith. We apologize. Um, NASA um, proving once again it doesn't take any chances with weather. Um, a lot of people would say, well, if they were willing to take a chance on the phone flying off, um, why wouldn't they take a chance here, I suppose? Um, what do you, what you, try to give people a sense of perspective. You were talking a little bit earlier about how sometimes uh, the explanation of how NASA uh, handles the risk and calculates the risk, that message doesn't get through loud and clear to the public. Well, NASA's not known oftentimes for being clear and saying what they mean and meaning what they say. And the issue isn't so much the decision that was made, because as you, uh, you mentioned before, uh, Columbia was not impacted in its ability to safely take the crew into orbit. The issue was damage that was done during ascent to bring them back. During the flight net readiness review, Brian O'Connor, the uh, head, uh, head of the safety office, and Chris Scalise, the chief engineer, said they were no-go for launch but it was okay to go ahead with the mission. Now that sounds kind of contradictory, but as you parse this and as NASA tried to spin and explain this all after the fact, what was really going on here is that 
they were voting no go to launch the vehicle because of the risk to the vehicle but since the crew had a place to go to the international space station where they could stay for 82 or so days there wasn't going to be a risk to the crew but again nasa sort of stumbled at explaining this and then when uh, reporters tried to get documents that went with this review the flight readiness review nasa refused to post them even though they had put the very same documents uh, out for the public to see before uh eileen connor's mission of course you know i got a hold of one of those documents uh having to do with the external tank and i posted it on nasa watch and if you look at it and uh, get through all the arcane nasa east there's really nothing controversial in there yet you got to ask why nasa is so reluctant to uh, put this information out and why they just can't figure out how to say things very plainly and explain what it is that actually happened that's a problem well it's you know, I guess you could say it's a very technical thing, and these are engineers who maybe aren't, that isn't their, their specialty in communicating to the general public, uh, but it's an important thing to do because the general public ultimately is your constituency. Absolutely. You just explained it. I just explained it. Perhaps they need to hire some media types and uh, teach them a little engineering. Somewhere in the mix, you might get a, a better explanation for things. And oftentimes, it's not NASA's technical abilities. It's its ability to relate not only decisions it's made, but also what it's doing and why that's important to a broader audience. So this is a, a bigger and more long-term problem that NASA's had, communicating clearly to the public. You know, I'm reminded as we watch this uh, countdown, which was postponed or scrubbed in the, the NASA vernacular uh, today, about how um, labor-intensive this particular machine is uh, and how the next idea, the next plan, the crew exploration vehicle, which harkens back to the Apollo capsules and the Gemini capsules, in many respects uh, is going to be a lot simpler to fly and matter probably would have probably would have launched today because you don't have the requirement of a pilot having to glide back to a runway landing. There you see some animation of this crew exploration vehicle they've just dubbed Ares. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it, going back to the future in this case, is that a wise thing? I think it is, and I think you know you learn along the way, and uh, you'll see, of course, that these vehicles are meant to be uh, derived in some aspects from what the shuttle's doing, but it's you know taking some of the more vulnerable things out, most notably the way the shuttle orbiter is placed on the uh, the stack, as they call it, and how it could be damaged by virtue of stuff coming off. In the future, the crew will be on top of things such that either things falling off can't damage the uh, spacecraft, or if there's a problem, they can pull away just like they could do during the Apollo era, but. Uh, hopefully that system's going to be a lot simpler to run. And of course, you know, the, the shuttle that we see today is a, a vintage 70s and 80s era design. Of course, that also means that there'll be a lot fewer people working there, and that's going to be a big political issue for NASA when it finally uh, owes up to the fact that thousands of people are going to eventually be laid off. It may be the politics well, that's more difficult to do than the engineering. Sometimes, as a matter of fact, most times that is true. Keith Cowing, thank you very, very much. Uh, the editor-in-chief of NASAWatch.com. Eileen Collins, let's button it up with you. Um, what's it like at this point? The crew's got to be let down. They've got to be exhausted. They, gotta, they went through an emotional high here a little while ago. Um, is coming back from this difficult? Well, you know, I've been through a weather scrub before, and it's, it's difficult. I think physically it's draining to uh, get up in the morning, suit up, get out to the launch pad, strap in, lay on your back for uh, as long as we do. It's uncomfortable to be on your back. And of course, you're psyched up and you're ready to go. And the weather's a disappointment, but frankly, you can't do anything about it. So you accept the fact that we scrubbed. I can't think of a time when NASA has bent the rules on the weather. Um, you just don't mess with the weather because, you know, we've got some pad in there to be a little bit extra safe because the weather is unpredictable. You don't know which way it's going to go. Um, we made the right decision today. I'm sure the crew agrees with that. And their job right now is to stay well rested because they may have, they may be called back here tomorrow to make another launch attempt. We'll leave it at that. Eileen Collins, uh, former shuttle commander, Keith Cowing of nasawatch.com. And uh, thanks to all of our viewers around the world for joining us on this hour special on Discovery's attempted launch today scrubbed on account of weather. We'll keep you posted as to when they will try again. Stay with CNN for complete coverage of the NASA Space Shuttle flight, the second after the Space Shuttle Columbia, whenever it happens. I'm Miles O'Brien, live from the Kennedy Space Center. at CNN World Headquarters right here in Atlanta. The third time may not be the charm for Space Shuttle Discovery. Liftoff once again in question. Our Miles O'Brien has the details on this latest setback. Also, 
The rocks snagged for the space shuttle, a crack in the foam on the fuel tank. Will it delay discovery again? Our space correspondent, Miles O'Brien, is right on top of all of this. Miles, you've been in wait and see mode all weekend long. Now it's Monday. What's NASA telling you? Yes, we have gone through a couple of launch scrubs. That might have a lot to do with why this crack has appeared on the external fuel tank of the Space Shuttle Discovery. A meeting has been underway. We do expect to hear very shortly from the mission management team with their decision on how to proceed. Take a look at live pictures. There's launch pad 39B. Looks like a beautiful day down at the Cape. The Space Shuttle enveloped inside that gray scaffolding, sort of its cocoon there, the rotating service structure, they call it. Let's go to an animation, uh, a graphic there, and I'll just give you a sense of where this crack was found. Right up in this area here, this is called the intertank region. There's actually two tanks inside that orange fuel tank. Oxygen is up here. Behind the shuttle here is hydrogen. Intertank area is right in the middle, and that's where the two meet. There are some pipes which connect them on the outside, and one of those pipes, the one that feeds oxygen, is where this crack is uh, located. Let's take a look at a close-up of it now. This is coming to us uh, through the Orlando Sentinel. And uh, there you can see it right across. It's on a diagonal, right like that. I don't want to keep it covered over. I just wanted to train your eye to it. It is all of five inches in length and one-eighth of an inch in depth. That doesn't sound like very much. But if ice were to form in there, it could easily break away a uh, fairly substantial piece of foam. And given its location, as we just told you, sort of upstream of the orbiter itself, that is a big concern because, of course, uh, we're talking about the possibility of some damage to the orbiter. Harkening back to three and a half years ago, Space Shuttle Columbia, big piece of foam hitting the leading edge of the left wing, causing a fatal breach to the heat shield. Let me show you what it, how this foam is applied. Most of it is applied by a robotic paint uh, uh, operating system. There are key places like this where pipes and brackets occur, where the application of the foam is done by hand, as you see here. It's done in New Orleans at a, uh, the facility, the Michou facility there. You're seeing some of the hand spraying that goes on in every single case of foam uh, that has been difficult for NASA and has caused problems and has fallen off has been hand sprayed foam. So they've been working on techniques to make it go on uh, a little more evenly with fewer air bubbles, less of an opportunity for it to crack. Let's go back there and remind you what we're talking about here, the Space Shuttle Columbia. This is January of 2003. Take a look right there in that area. And you can see that foam kind of blast through, through there. At the time, NASA thought foam was a harmless thing, like a styrofoam cooler blowing off of a pickup truck on a uh, highway. Uh, they learned, of course, 16 days later that it was much more lethal than that, the crew of seven perishing as they returned to Earth. NASA spent a ye uh, two years and a half and a billion dollars redesigning the tank, and look what happened last year when Discovery flew. Right down there, another big piece of foam falling away, in this case, fortunately, harmlessly, not striking the wing or any portion of the orbiter, but it really was a wake-up call for NASA to go for another redesign. Still, in many cases, there are pieces of foam on there that are causing the attention of engineers and concern. And now that this crack has been found, NASA has to decide what to do about it. Everything from swapping out the fuel tank is an option to flying as is is another option. Somewhere in between probably is where the way we'll see this go. It can be repaired on the launch pad if need be. A patch can be made on that cracked foam. So in just a short time, we should hear from uh, the officials. As it stands right now, though, uh, the countdown clock resume is continuing for a planned launch tomorrow, the 4th of July, Independence Day. That would be a first ever launch on Independence Day at 2.38 p.m. Eastern Time. And Betty, we, you and I, we walked through those um, scrubs over the weekend. Mm -hmm. And it might very well be that the flexing that the tank goes through as that super cold hydrogen and oxygen comes in uh, is the source of creating that crack. So that might make NASA managers think about tanking up or loading up that cold cryogenic fuel on a really bad weather day the next time. Right, yeah, that makes good sense. But let me ask you this. You mentioned that they could possibly fix it while it's out on the pad, but in doing so, wouldn't they have to build some scaffolding? And that's going to take some time. So could they really realistically launch tomorrow? Well, take a look at that pad. If we can put that through the telestrator, and I'll show you exactly why it is possible. If you look at that rotating service structure underneath there is, that is the inner tank region right in there. And if you look, there is scaffolding access. This whole 
facility here, the rotating service structure, is designed for this kind of scenario, so they have access to the external portion of the orbiter that is not reachable by the normal gantry there, and it's been closed up there, so it might very well be they have good access to this location and can do the job. That's a good question. Yeah, we'll wait and see what NASA has to say. That news conference should be happening any minute now. And when it does, of course, Miles, we will bring it live, and you will be there to assist us. Thank you, Miles. All right. We have for this hot dog, apple pie, and rocket launch edition of American Morning. <laughs> I'm Miles O'Brien, live at the Kennedy Space Center. Carol? And I'm Carol Costello here in, here in New York. Happy Fourth of July. Darren Kagan takes it away now. Carol, you enjoy your holiday. And uh, Miles, I don't think you're going anywhere. <laughs> Stay right here. Hey, Sarah, right good here. Boy. Good, good boy. All right, we'll get started. Carol, we'll see you uh, tomorrow. Enjoy I'll the, be here. Enjoy the rest of the day. Well, you can light a candle on America's birthday. NASA counting down to an afternoon launch of Space Shuttle Discovery. But are the astronauts safe on board the shuttle? We are live, as you saw, at Kennedy Space Center. Independence Day celebrations are a little extra special. <laughs> Fourth of July and the rocket's red glare. Eyes on the skies at Florida's Kennedy Space Center this morning. NASA saying that thunderstorms that scrubbed the last two launch attempts should not be much of a threat today. But, you know, we're not only talking about the weather here. Now to set the stage, here's CNN's John Zarella. A tiny crack in foam insulation on the shuttle Discovery's external tank turned out not to be serious enough to ruin NASA's Fourth of July plans. After a lengthy mission management meeting, the space agency decided the shuttle was good to go for launch. Lots of discussions from many people during the, the review. Uh, very good discussion across the team members, but essentially uh, no dissenting opinions with where we're going. A routine inspection of the vehicle had found a 5-inch long, 1-8 inch deep crack in insulation on a bracket on the upper end of the external tank. A tiny chunk of foam that looked like a piece of bread crust was also found at the base of the vehicle. This size foam loss is within our design criteria. It's acceptable to lose this size of, size of foam. Engineering teams spent the day Monday working three issues. Would the crack allow additional ice to build up in the area? Would the remaining foam stay in place? And would the tiny missing piece cause additional heat buildup? Engineers used a camera to get these close-up looks at the suspect area. Those views show that the foam is, is structurally intact. It shows that the gaps that are supposed to be there between the two pieces of remaining foam are clear of debris. There's no loose, loose foam in there. It all looks fine and the structure is in, in good shape. Foam insulation has been a major concern for the space agency since the Columbia accident. A piece of foam that broke off the tank and struck Columbia breached the heat shielding, causing Columbia to break up on re-entry. Last summer, another piece of foam broke off Discovery, but did not damage the vehicle. Space agency officials say this latest foam issue would not have gotten as much attention prior to Columbia. So that was John Zarella. He's down in Florida. So is our spaceman for the space program, Miles O'Brien at Kennedy Space Center this morning. Miles, a return trip for you. A return trip. They say uh, the third time is a charm. There's a little <laughs> cliche for you, but what the heck. Let's use it. Whatever it takes to get the space shuttle into space today, we hope um, the crew of seven declares independence from Earth on this 4th of July. Uh, as it stands right now, everything seems to be marching toward that uh, very outcome. The weather is good. Uh, nice pictures there, the space shuttle Discovery on the launch pad, 39B here, about three and a half miles from where I'm sitting right now. We've had a few cumulus clouds come in, a few clouds with some precipitation, which have uh, briefly put the weather outlook, at least for that moment, if they had to launch at that moment, uh, as a no-go. But once again, that forecast remains 80% the weather will permit a launch. Take a look at the crew going through their Groundhog Day type ritual. Yet another uh, photo opportunity in the crew quarters, sitting at that table, uh, but not eating a thing. They obviously don't like the cake and had breakfast already, but there they are, uh, Commander Steve Lindsay, uh, six other crew members, uh, and they will be making their way toward the International Space Station if all goes well today uh, for a two-week mission. They're going to drop off about 5,000 pounds of equipment, as well as a crew member, Thomas Ryder of Germany, who will spend six months up there. This is what's going on at the launch pad right now, the so-called ICE team. These are the guys who go out there after the space shuttle is fueled up with 500,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen and oxygen. They look all over the exterior 
using binoculars, telescopes, telephoto lenses, sniffing devices, whatever it takes to find out if there's ice buildup, if there's debris, if there's any sort of unusual leaks. And they've given it so far a clean bill of health, putting uh, extra focus, of course, on that little crack that John Zerola was just telling you about. It, too, clean as a whistle. In spite of all that we see here, we have been asking the NASA administration if, in fact, there was perhaps a rush to launch today. Could they have perhaps taken another day to further analyze that crack? I asked Mike Griffin, NASA administrator, if they have any launch fever. We work through the, the count. If we get to the point where we're going to violate one of our launch commit criteria, we stand down. You saw that twice in the last three days. Um, if we get to the end of the count and we weaved our way through the launch commit criteria with no violation, we go. That's how we do it. Mike Griffin, NASA Administrator, denying there's any pressure to launch. As a matter of fact, saying that that whole issue of the crack foam was an issue that got more attention than it probably deserved. However, in the wake of Columbia and the fact that a big piece of foam caused its demise some three and a half years ago, anytime there's a problem with foam, it will get the attention of the media and, of course, the engineers inside the NASA Space Shuttle program. So here we stand with a decent weather outlook and an orbiter that has no technical glitches. Knock on wood. 2.38 p.m. Eastern Time, the intended launch, a special on CNN beginning at 2 p.m. Eastern. Stay with us all day for an amazing fireworks show, Darren. All right, we will. We'll check in back with you in about 10 minutes, Miles. Well, we also want to hear from you this the weather. It looks like it's improving, and so are the chances of an afternoon launch of Space Shuttle Discovery. It's a story we are following very closely all morning and afternoon here on CNN. It wasn't just thunderstorms, of, co of course, threatening today's liftoff. Let's check off. Let's check in, actually, with space correspondent Miles O'Brien at Kennedy Space Center. Miles, hello again. Yeah, you know, you know Darren, it's amazing. A lot of people ask me, the, the Space Shuttle, as hardy as it is, why can't it fly through a simple rain cloud? Well, take a look at this. This is a piece of the... Uh, tile, some of the thermal tile, it's an actual tile, uh, and I didn't take it off Discovery. This is actually excess. But look at how easily it chips. And you can imagine flying through a, a storm cloud at 700,000 miles an hour, whatever it would be, it'd be like pressure washing this very fragile tile. So they don't fly through the simplest storm cloud that's a very sensitive and yet very hardy uh, piece of equipment. Man who knows a little bit something, little something about riding one of these rockets. Matter of fact, he wrote a book called Riding Rockets, which is just uh, rocketing to the top of the Amazon charts these days. Is former NASA astronaut Mike Mullane here to give us a little insight into what's going on Good inside morning, the mind of a crew member on a day like this? Good to have you with us. Well, thank you. It's a great book because uh, it offers great insight into what's in the mind of an astronaut. Before we get to that, though, phone. Uh, you're tired of hearing about. I'm tired it. of hearing about. You've had enough <laughs> foam, uh, and uh, if you were if you were writing in your book, you'd probably write it in a very more a more colorful way than you can share with us now. Exactly. But tell us this though: foam, foam has fallen off from day one. Uh, it's obviously caused the, the the demise of Columbia. You got to pay attention to it, don't you? Oh yeah, yeah. And and NASA has paid attention to it. Yeah, you know, I, I I think they've done a terrific job. Uh, and I know as a crew member, you're going to have a high degree of confidence in the, in the heat shield and the foam. And, the foam. Uh, and particularly on a mission where you can inspect the heat shield, as they can, with a robot arm and some lasers, and approach the International Space Station, do a flip around, have high resolution photography taken, you ha you're going to know the state of your heat shield and know if it's been damaged. And if it has been, you have the outpost of the International Space Station to wait it out. So uh, the crew is not going to be devoting a lot of heartbeats to worry about uh, about the foam. It's going to be worry about ascent, that eight and a half minute ride. So if you're inside the crew quarters, uh, enduring the, a couple of scrubs like this, what is on your mind? You're not, if you're not thinking about foam, what are you thinking about? Well, the, the scrubs are emotionally exhausting, first of all, particularly if, you, if it's scrubbed after you're strapped in. I mean, if it's scrubbed before that, it's not so bad. But once you get out there, you've invested all of this adrenaline uh, in the cockpit, uh, all the physical pain, and it is physically painful to be laying out there for hours and hours. And now to have it scrubbed, that is very emotionally draining, physically draining. Uh, then you have to recycle and say the goodbye, the emotional goodbye to the families. The families, of course, are, have been stressed out too. So it's just a, it's very emotionally and physically draining to go through these scrubs. Uh, in the crew quarters, you want to have all your time occupied, and most of it is with briefings and uh, getting suited up. Uh, I know we, we did have a little time uh, on some of my missions after suit up, and they play this dumb 
fighter pilot card game called Possum Fargo, which the the worst hand wins. It doesn't take a lot of brain power to uh, to play this play this game. But fighter it, but pilot it, friendly. Yeah, exactly. I didn't want to say that. I'll get hate mail. But uh, but it's uh, it's something to, again to occupy you, just to to fill fill the time because it is stressful. I mean, you you know that you're going out there. Uh, you're putting your life on the line. You're riding this rocket. There's a lot of things that uh, er, there's a great team. You have a great great team behind you. You have great confidence in that team, but you know that it's a complex machine operating on the edge of the envelope, and uh, you worry about that. Mike Mullane, former astronaut. I know for a fact today they're watching a movie, The Fastest Indian. Don't know much more yeah, about I, it. Than I think it has something to do with motorcycle racing. So yeah. there, there you have it. They're keeping their mind on other things, trying to stay loose. It is game day, after all. I bet it's not the sound of music. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. None of that. Heidi, no. <laughs> Uh, Mike Mullane, author of Riding Rockets and uh, Shuttle Flyer Extraordinaire. Thanks for being with us once again. Thank you, Miles. Thank, Thank you, you very Darren. much. That was an Anthony Hopkins movie that was out a few minutes ago. Oh, is that it? Yeah, and he played, it's a true story of the Speed Demon, a guy who... Yeah, who, yeah. Well, you know, you, once again, you connect <laughs> me to pop culture in ways that I am just completely <laughs> clueless. Thank you, Darren. You explain the technology, I explain the real yes. world out there to you, Miles. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, it is 4th of July. You knew that. You probably said 1057 and verify 1058, 1059, and 1060. Copy all. ISL, JRPS, and Houston Flight perform the L-15 recorder activation. ISL? ISL copies. JRPS? JRPS copy. And Houston Flight. Houston Flight copies. We'll put it in work. Attention all personnel, this is the entity conducting the launch status check. Verify ready to resume count and go for launch. OTC? Go. TBC? Go. TTC? TTC is go. LPS? Go. Houston flight? Houston flight is go. Myla? Myla go. STM? STM is go. Safety console? Safety console is go. SPE? SP is go. LRD? LRD is go. SRO? SRO is go, you have range clear launch. And CDR? CDR. 
Star and Cove. Copy all, and launch director NTD, our launch team is ready to proceed. Copy that, thank you, Jeff. Chief Engineer, verify no constraints to launch. Chief Engineer, team is go, Mike. Thank you, Charlie. KSC, safety and mission assurance. KSC, safety is go. Thank you. Halo, launch manager. Mike, the space station team is go. Thank you a lot, Bill. Range weather. Weather has no constraints to launch. Copy, Kathy, thank you. And ops manager. Launch director, ops manager, the MMT has no constraints. You are clear to launch. Thank you, sir. Discovery launch director. Discovery, go. Okay, Steve. Looks like Discovery's weather is <laughs> Discovery is ready. The weather is beautiful. America is ready to return the space shuttle to flight. So good luck and Godspeed, Discovery. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, I can't think of a better place to be here on the Fourth of July and Independence Day to be getting ready to launch into space. To all the folks at Kennedy Space Center and the shuttle program, thanks a lot for working so hard in the uh, last few days and the last year to get us ready. To all the folks in the Florida East Coast. Uh, uh, we hope to very soon uh, get you an up close and personal look at the rocket's red glare. Very nice, CDR. Appreciate those words. Good luck, guys. And NTD launch director, with that, you're cleared for this launch. Copy. Thank you, sir. T-minus nine minutes and holding with three minutes remaining in our built-in hold. And attention all personnel, our countdown clock will resume in two minutes, 45 seconds. Countdown clock will resume in two minutes. T minus nine minutes and holding with one minute remaining in our hold. And we are just about 20 seconds away from resuming the countdown for the launch of Space Shuttle Discovery today. The, the countdown clock will start in three, two, one. And we are at T-minus nine minutes and counting. And the ground launch sequencer has been initiated. NASA Test Director Jeff Spaulding is about to call for the transmittal of stored pre-launch commands as Discovery is prepared for a launch on Shuttle Mission STS-121, less than nine minutes away on a 12-day mission to the International Space Station.
CLT, OTC. CLT, go. Connect essential buses to fuel cells for your checklist. CLT, that's in work. Pilot Mark Kelly is now flipping switches in the cockpit to directly connect the three fuel cells to the essential power buses. Copy. Coming up on orbiter access arm retract. This is a walkway used by the crew to gain entry and access to the vehicle. It can be returned to position within seconds if necessary. CLS is go for orbiter access arm retract. Discovery on this our Independence Day. It is time to put this nation back into space and on course for our journey to Mars. Good luck and have some fun up there. Thank you, we will. The orbiter access arm is being retracted at this time. T minus seven minutes and counting. JRPS ODC. JRPS. Start APU display recorders. Recorders are running. PLT OTC. PLT go. Perform APU pre-start. CLT in work. The orbiter test conductor, Rudy Tench, has given pilot Mark Kev Kelly the go-ahead to perform the auxiliary power unit pre-start procedures. T-minus six minutes and counting. OTC PLT APU pre-start complete. Three great talkbacks. Thank you, PLT. T-minus five minutes, 30 seconds, and counting. T-minus five minutes of counting, and we have a go for APU start. The auxiliary power unit activation is being reported complete. T-minus four minutes, 30 seconds, and counting. The primary objective of this mission is to continue to test new equipment and procedures that increase the safety of space shuttle flights and to deliver critical supplies to the International Space Station. T-minus four minutes and counting, coming up on a final test of the flight control services. That's now being conducted. This is a program pattern of movements designed to verify the readiness for launch of the engines and other flight control surfaces.
T-minus three minutes and counting. Everything is looking good for launch today, hoping to add to the country's 4th of July Independence Day celebrations. CLS is go for ET, LO2, pressurization. PLT, OTC. PLT, go ahead. Clear a caution and warning memory. Verify no unexpected errors. PLT, alert. OTC, PLT, caution warning memory cleared. No unexpected errors. OTC, copy. The gaseous oxygen vent hood is being retracted away from the top of the external tank at this time. Discovery, OTC. Close and lock your visors and initiate O2 flow. Copy and work. T minus two minutes and counting. Let's go for ET LH2 pressurization. T minus ninety seconds and counting. All systems are go. We're about 90 seconds from the launch of Space Shuttle Discovery. T minus 60 seconds and counting. Transferring to orbiter internal power at this time. Discovery is now running off its three onboard fuel cells. Coming up on a go for auto sequence start. Okay, let's go for auto sequence start. And we have a go for auto sequence start. Scart. Discovery's onboard computers have primary control of all the vehicle's critical functions. T minus 17 seconds and counting. 15, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Go for main engine start. Main engine start. 2, 1, booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery, returning to the space station, paving the way for future missions beyond. Houston now controlling the flight of Discovery. The space shuttle begins the journey back into orbit. Discovery completes its role. The shuttle now heads down wings level for the eight and a half minute line to orbit. This view from a camera on the external tank's liquid oxygen feed line showing the bird's eye view of Discovery as it races towards space. A star-spangled start to Discovery's mission. Discovery's three liquid fuel main engines now throttle back to 67% of rated performance, reducing the stress on the shuttle as it breaks through the sound barrier. Discovery already three and a half miles in altitude, one and a half miles downrange, traveling almost 750 miles an hour. Everything looking good on the bird. 57 seconds into the flight, engines beginning to rev up. Standing by for the throttle up call from Capcom Steve Frick. Discovery Houston, go at throttle up. Roger, go at throttle up, Jones USF only. The throttle up call acknowledged by Commander Steve Lindsay. And Discovery Houston, it's expected data hits, it'll clear shortly. Copy. Lindsay joined on the flight deck by pilot Mark Kelly, flight engineer Lisa Nowak, and mission specialist Mike Fossum. Mission specialists Piers Sellers, Stephanie Wilson, and Tomas Ryder of the European Space Agency down on the mid-deck. Ryder headed for six months on the International Space Station. One minute, 47 seconds into the flight, 22 miles in altitude, 18 miles downrange, traveling 2,600 miles an hour. 
standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Solid rocket booster separation confirmed. Guidance now converging. Discovery's onboard computers commanding the main engine nozzles to swivel, aiming the shuttle for its precise target in space for main engine cutoff. And we should have a good forward link now on S-Bend. Hey, and you sound good. Two minutes, 35 seconds into the flight, 39 miles in altitude for Discovery, 49 miles downrange, traveling 3,200 miles an hour. Discovery now flying on the singular power of its three liquid fuel main engines, those power plants draining a half a ton of fuel per second from the shuttle's fuel tank. Copy, two engine Maroon. That call from Capcom Steve Frick indicating should we lose a main engine, we can make our trans-oceanic abort target at Maroon, Spain, but all three main engines are humming along, along with the auxiliary power units and the three power-producing fuel cells. Booster officer here in Mission Control confirms three good main engines, Discovery straight as an arrow, speeding toward a date with the International Space Station on Thursday. Three and a half minutes into the flight, Discovery now 53 miles in altitude, 100 miles downrange, speeding along at a clip of more than 4,000 miles an hour. Discovering nearing the point of negative return where the shuttle would be too far downrange, too high in altitude to return to the launch site in the event of an engine failure. Discovery Houston, negative return. Copy, negative return. Four minutes, eight seconds into the flight, Discovery 61 miles in altitude, 150 miles downrange, 5,000 miles an hour is its speed. The environmental systems officer reports a good flash evaporator system activated, providing cooling for Discovery's avionics until the time that we open the payload bay doors an hour and a half into the flight. More than halfway to orbit now at the 4 minute 39 second point into the flight, Discovery 65 miles in altitude, 200 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center. Discover Houston, no action on the left dome's tank P. It was due to the left dome's accumulator, but it's back up to a good pressure. Yeah, we see that, Houston. Roger, no action. That call, an instrumentation issue, no impact. Discovery in good shape, 5 minutes, 15 seconds into the flight. 255 miles downrange, traveling almost 7,000 miles an hour. Discovery soon will be rolling to a heads-up position through the swiveling of its main engines, enabling the shuttle to gain more favorable communications through the tracking of data relay satellite as it heads uphill. Houston, press to ATO, select Istris. Roger, press to ATO, selecting Istris. Discovery Houston, single engine, Ops 3. Single engine, Ops 3. Those calls indicating that we can make our uh, minimal Orbital cutoff targets in the event of a dual engine failure. Roll the heads up uh, in the plain view of this camera on the liquid oxygen feed line. Everything looking good for Discovery. Six minutes, 11 seconds into the flight. Discovery Houston, single engine Istris 104. Roger, single engine Istris 104. That call indicating that we can make our uh, transoceanic abort targets in the event of a dual engine failure. However, all three engines on Discovery continue to function normally, along with the auxiliary power units and the fuel cells. Six minutes, 40 seconds into the flight. Two minutes of powered flight remaining for Discovery. Discovery Houston, press to Miko. We show a nominal shutdown plan. Your go for the plus X and go for the pitch maneuver. Copy, 
Costa Rica, go for the plus X, go for the uh, pitch maneuver, and uh, not a Rico. Those calls acknowledged uh, by Steve Lindsay, Discovery's commander, indicating with Discovery now 516 miles downrange that we can make our main uh, engine cutoff targets, uh, all three engines, in good shape, and that uh, Lindsay will be given the green light to pitch up Discovery to allow uh, umbilical well photography of the external tank after it is discarded. Seven and a half minutes into the flight, Discovery's main engines soon will be throttled down to limit the stress on the shuttle and its seven crew members to that of three times the effect of gravity. Discovery currently traveling at a speed of more than four miles a second. Discovery traveling 14,000 miles an hour, 675 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, about 40 seconds of powered flight remaining. Eight minutes, 15 seconds into the flight. Everything looking good on Discovery, standing by for main engine cutoff. That will be followed a few seconds later by the separation of the external fuel tank. The booster officer reports that we have main engine cutoff, standing by for external tank separation. External tank separation confirmed. Commander Steve Lindsay now maneuvering Discovery to the correct orientation so that video and digital stills of the external tank can be captured by cameras embedded in the shuttle's umbilical well. A smooth ride to orbit for the shuttle Discovery embarking on what is expected to be a 13-day mission. In a couple of minutes, astronauts Mike Fossum and Stephanie Wilson will begin several minutes of video documentation. Discovery Houston, we showed a nominal MECO. Ohms 1 is not required. Yeah, copy and concur, yes. 